single most important aspect of using LightWave in compositing is something called front projection mapping. It is also the biggest stumbling block that most people come across when they're starting to use LightWave to create, composite, and imagery for composites. It's not that difficult, it's just a lot to swallow at one time. So what I'm going to do is load up an image to use an example. This is an image of an old building. I'm going to put it in my background layer. Now in order to see this in my camera view, I need to go to my display property, display options, towards the bottom we have camera view background we're going to display background image and that pops the image up in our background I have my resolution fairly high here so I have a nice looking image this is a background image now what we will do is add some geometry a very very simple piece of geometry it's a square. It doesn't get a lot simpler than that. Now what I'm going to do is map that background image onto the square. So I go into my surface editor go into the texture map and select the same image. Now I have this turned on so we can see it and like you would expect it is mapped onto the square moving around with the square now what I want is that background image to map to match exactly what I have on the square now I could go in say I'll move my camera in forward and then stretch the scale of my image map so it kind of matches I'm looking at the post right here and I can see now oh, that's kind of matching my background problem is if I grab that object and move it it's still going along. Oh well. Well, I can always go back to my surface editor, the image, turn on world coordinates. Now, what that does is basically unattach the image from the geometry. Now, when I move the geometry, just that big square, I move it back and forth, the image stays. Well, that's not so bad. Unless, of course, I move it back or forward. So we need something a little bit better. And, you know, this does have its applications. Don't get me wrong. Uh, one of the drawbacks of front projection mapping, you will find it does not work with bump mapping. So then you have to resort to something like this. But that's jumping through a few hoops. We can do things a lot easier. So I'm going to replace my object with the same object, but I still have the default default surface. Okay. So I have my object. Big gray square. This time I'm going to take this image, also map it, select my old building, but this time instead of using planar mapping, I am going to select front projection mapping. Now look what happens. Now this is our OpenGL display. It will not always show things perfectly. It will render perfectly. Now see when I move my square around, my background image is matching. It gets a little distorted when I rotate it and that is just purely an OpenGL thing. Because when I render this out, I'll just do a quick render. You 
can kind of make out the square here, but see the image is dead on. A little darker here. Still distorted. It's only distorted in the OpenGL. You can see it almost looks like it's transparent. Like it's a piece of smoky glass. It's just that the background image is mapped on that surface and it's perfectly registered with the background. By being perfectly registered, what I mean is the background image is going to line up perfectly with whatever is mapped on there. Don't make the mistake of thinking this is transparent. This is a solid piece of geometry. And we're going to see that in just a moment. It's just that it's perfectly lined up with whatever we have in our background image. So here we have our square with the front projection map. In our perspective view we see it here. I'm going to add something else. Uh, let's just grab grab an apple. I'm going to place it behind the object. Let's scale it up a little bit just for fun. Go back to our camera view. Okay, it's hiding behind there. Go to wireframe. We can see it's behind there. The apple is selected. And move it right about here. And what does this look like? Well, it looks like that. If I render this out, we have what looks like half an apple. And we have this big square. Well, it doesn't look like much of a composite. Let's try this. Let's move the square. There are two things we need to do. We need to match the lighting of the square and we also need to adjust its position. So I'm just going to quickly rotate this square so it matches up to one of the lines that we have here. In this case, the rooftop. So right there. And take my apple. And put it there so it looks like it's coming up from behind the roof. And since this is about animation, why don't we animate this? Advance to here. Create a keyframe of it coming up here. There we go. Now that's not looking too bad the way it is. Let's render it out, see what we have. It's still not working because we have this dark area. Well, how do we fix that? Well, when you have an image in the background, it's not being lit by any of the lights in in layout. The default light, the ambient light, is not having any effect on whatever the background image. So we have to duplicate that effect with our surface. So how do we do that? For one thing, we take down our diffuse. A diffuse is something that that is doesn't really exist in the real world. It tells a surface we see its effects but there isn't we don't have like diffuse paint um, diffuse is literally how much the surface reacts to light so if I set that to zero it means it's not reacting to any light at all it's not reacting to the ambient light it's not reacting to the direct light so what we want to do is replace that light with our luminosity now later on we'll get into how we balance diffuse and luminosity because they kind of work together. In this case we're just going to set our diffuse to zero and luminosity to 100 percent. Now because we don't have radi uh, radiosity turned on it's not going to illuminate anything with that luminosity. Another miscomprehension many people have is if we make an object luminous it's going to cast light. That only happens when radiosity is activated. We are not using radiosity here, so it's just going to illuminate itself, nothing else surrounding it. Now, we can see right here in layout, it seems like our, our uh, square has disappeared. 
it has not disappeared, it's just become camouflaged. It's exactly matching the background. And we can see here the animator or apple coming up over the rise. If I render this out, you know, the line is gone. Look at that that square, which we know is right here, is perfectly matched. Now we can see a little bit of a little bit of edging because the line is not perfectly flat. So there is a little bit of spill right here, very slight. But this is just a straight line. This is kind of stepped, and you know, that's not bad. If it happens quickly, nobody's going to notice that. Now, okay, this is interesting, but you know, I could have taken this into my compositing program and just made a mask here, you know, paint it out, do a holdout mask uh, using After Effects or Aura or Mirage. The difference is, I can do this. Let's put, let's see, grab my apple, keyframe that back at 30, and at 60, I'm going to move it forward. So now it look, appears as if the apple is coming up maybe outside of the building and coming down in front of it. Something a little more difficult to do. Now this is just a real simple example. Uh, if you've seen where you have um, sparkles going around somebody, you know, whenever you have something coming in and out in front and behind, it has the illusion of moving in 3D space. Well, you know, call it illusion, call it just compositing in 3D. But we can see here's our path of the apple coming up behind our holdout area. I have replaced the apple with something uh, a little more likely to see flying around, which is a UFO, which happens, you know, quite often in movies. In this case, I want to see, well, let's say UFO starting over here. And as it's moving, we want it to go behind the building. Let's go behind this building, and oh, we'll start over here, way off in the distance. Go behind the building, uh, go up. A little bit forward. And then down front. In front of our object here. Now the problem here, oh look at that. It's moving through. I don't have my front square set up correctly. Well I could add another square. One of the things we can do with front projection especially in something like this, there are two ways to approach this situation. One is I could go in and create a stencil that pretty much follows this. That's not a bad way of doing it. I could also use something called a clip map which will cut out this other area. So let's try both ways. So I'm going to pop into Modeler for a moment. And here we have the, the square that we started with. Instead of doing that, I'm going to start from scratch, create a new object. I'm going to put something in my background. Bottom left, old building, and there it is. And, you know, that'll be fine for now. A nice feature in Lightwave 8 is this cool little tab here saves me the trouble of hitting the zero key. So I have my image. I'm going to use my pen tool 
and basically sketch out this outline. Looks like I need to up my res a little bit. In my image, there we are. I'm going to go over this quickly. Normally, something like this I would do with the much more care. But I am basically outlining this object crudely. And I admit I did pick this particular object because it has nice sharp angles, geometric corners. So I'm made for a good example. So right here I have just a piece of geometry, uh, just like a stencil. I'm going to use this. Let's send, we'll save this. And we're going to switch back. Here I'm going to take out my front square, load up the stencil that I just made. Okay, it's not matching, but that's okay. Let's switch to wireframe. Scale it up, and it's more or less matching. Close enough for now. Texture solid. And I have to go in and apply my front projection map, old building. There we go. You can see it's not quite matching up. That's because we haven't selected front. And there we are. It's pretty much matching up. Now let's see our UFO path matches up. Oh, need to have that at zero. There we go. And we got lucky. It's pretty much matching up there. Take a look through our camera view. Sure enough. Okay, we also need to set our surface to the stencil to 100% luminous and 0% diffuse so everything matches up. You see there's a little bit of a line there, but it's not too bad. So our object will be moving behind. over the top. And I did this in real time. You saw me do this um, in about five minutes. It's a fairly sophisticated effect, you know, moving in and out of our background image. Not that difficult once you understand the concept of front projection mapping. Now that was using the stencil object. Save all objects, and I'm going to save this scene, and this will be on the CD. Filling stencil. Okay. Now, this was creating a stencil. There's an even faster way of doing this. Let's switch this back to wireframe. Well, it's texture wireframe. I am going to take out my stencil. And then just add in the square once again. I'm going to size it up so it fills the whole place. Apply the front projection surface. So we have front and the old building. Now I have created another image using this. which is a clip map, which follows the contours. I basically, I took it into a paint program, used a flood fill, and filled in all the sky with white and all the buildings with black. I'm going to go in under Object Properties, under Render, where it says Clip Map, and select the clip image. Now, what will happen here is Everything with the white on it will be removed from the background. 
Everything with black will stay there. And I'm going to select front projection mapping. Now when I took that image, and once again I cheated because this one is easy. I cheated by taking an image that had this solid background. It still didn't take much long, it took less time than to sketch it out with the pen tool and modeler, but because the flood fill covered all these areas here, it it rode along the edge much, n much nicer. Got a little weird around these trees, but I could have used keying, but I just didn't want to spend that much time. The only problem here is it's not quite as easy to see where the UFO is coming. That's kind of where the stencil has an advantage. But I can always go into my original scene editor at my front square. I'm going to switch this to front face wireframe just kind of eyeball it when it comes through. See what we get when we render this edge here. There's the image with the clip map. There's the UFO coming up behind the building. Let's see what it looks like when it's coming on the edge. This is a very important edge here. Uh, another thing I neglected to do was match my lighting not going to take a whole lot of time with that except just match the direction that apparently the sunlight is coming in the room into our scene here so that when it hits the UFO remember that will have no effect at all on this plane because it's zero percent diffuse it will just affect this geometry of the UFO that's coming into our scene here and it's a distant light, so the position doesn't matter, but the rotation does. And we need to have that zero. Let's check out our edge here. In fact, let's turn on anti-aliasing so you get a nice picture. Do a quick render. And that scene looks kind of dark. Did I remember? Nope, I did not adjust my luminosity and diffuse. There we go. You should now have a perfect match with a smooth edge and one that's lining up exactly with the side of the building. And it looks like we have it. And here we are. And I can see that it's off a little bit. I think the flood fill probably creeped over the edge too much but it did catch all these little knobs here and most of the time you will not be expanding at 200 percent but if you do you just need to be aware and adjust for it in your paint program and it just takes it takes seconds so it's one of the simplest things you do we still have a ways to go but the basics of this whole thing is using front projection on images, here we go. This is this has come out pretty nicely here. Got a little bit of bleed there, but we do have our image coming in. We have our UFO coming over the building and in front, apparently moving through 3D space and around objects in our background image. And that is the basics of compositing in a light wave. You can use flat images, put clip maps on them, or you could stencil them like you saw before, or use a combination of both. Uh, in fact, that may be the preferable way because you're not rendering extra imagery there. Also, I use a clip map instead of a transparency map. I could have mapped it on as transparency. However, when you're using transparency, it does not remove everything. For instance, if there was some shininess, which there shouldn't be, but it takes a lot longer to render transparency than it does a clip map. 
However, a clip map can give you a softer, or a transparency map, rather, if you're compositing something that has a soft edge, um, say like around the glass, you could use transparency, and you could actually th see through part of this geometry, even though it's front projection map. Uh, however, a clip map literally just, it's like a scissors and cuts out all that geometry and it renders much faster. A uh, little trick using clip maps, if you use a much bigger image, a clip map is just, if it's more than 50% white, it takes out the polygon from the rendering. If it's less than 50% white, it leaves it in. So you can only have the resolution of a single pixel. However, the background image I'm using here, I believe, uh, was like 1200 pixels by 768 or something like that. So they get squeezed down, so the resolution is actually pretty good, and it had a fairly soft edge. If you're using a lower res image for a clip map, you will see the stair stepping. But this is the basics of how you start with compositing with Lightweight. And everything is pretty much built on this front projection mapping.